Forget frequently asked questions. Common sense. Common knowledge. Or Google. How about advice from a real genius? 95% of people in any profession are good enough to be qualified and licensed. 5% go above and beyond. They become very good at what they do. But only 0.1% are real geniuses. Richard Jacobs has made it his life's mission to find them for you. He hunts down and interviews geniuses in every field. Sleep science, cancer, stem cells, ketogenic diets, and more. Here come the geniuses. This is the Finding Genius Podcast with Richard Jacobs. Hello, this is Richard Jacobs with the Finding Genius Podcast. I have a returning guest, uh, Dr. Thomas Seyfried. He's a professor at Boston College. Uh, he's part of the biology department, and he focuses quite a bit on cancer. Uh, he's written several books about it, and um, I'm having him here for a, a new cancer publication book I'm putting together where I'm going to interview you know, several dozen uh, cancer researchers. So, Tom, thanks for coming. I appreciate you being here. Oh, thanks, R- Richard. It's nice to be here. Yeah, uh, just to begin, could you uh, just give a, a background on what's your current research in regards to cancer about right now? Well, our current research right now is to develop a uh, a diet drug uh, cocktail that can be used to provide uh, non-toxic long-term management or possible resolution of the disease in, in its entirety. Mm, okay. Do you tend to focus on primary tumors or particular cancers or metastases or like what within cancer, there's a lot of areas. So what uh, are you focus more on the metabolism of cancer or? Well, you have to realize that all cancers are the same, whether it's brain, colon, breast. They all have the same the same underlying problem. They can't use oxygen to generate energy, so they ferment. There are only two major fuels that drive fermentation, and that's glucose and glutamine. So if we can uh, effectively target and restrict glucose and glutamine with diet-drug combinations, every known major cancer should be potentially manageable. Yeah, that would be phenomenal. You said they can't use, from what I understand, cells do what's called an oxidative phosphorylation to uh, to harness ATP. And then when you speak about fermentation, what's that process called and how is it different from oxphos? Well, fermentation is an ancient pathway. It, de- it generates energy without oxygen. And all organisms that existed on the planet before oxygen came into the atmosphere some 2.5 billion years ago, the organisms at that time were all fermenters. There was no oxygen. So uh, they would reproduce unbridled reproduction driven by fermentation metabolism. You know, it's a very efficient way to get to, to generate, to reproduce, proliferate, and keep the energy requirements in the cell stabilized. Now, of course, when these bacteria were able to capture and use oxygen to generate energy, that became the main source of development of metazoans, let's put it that way, the multicellular organisms which gave them the opportunity to do a lot more, perform a lot more functions and sophistications with a more efficient source of energy coming from uh, oxygen as a final acceptor of electrons. So this opened up the whole vast evolution of organisms on the planet. But that those ancient pathways of fermentation are still present in every one of the cells uh, of our body. The glycolytic pathway is an ancient metabolic pathway. And so is the glutaminolysis, amino acid fermentation. But these are ancient pathways. It's just they're very, very minor in, in most of the cells uh, of the body of metazoan cell of metazoans, all mammals. And so we're falling back. The cancer cells simply fall back on these ancient pathways to survive. And once you once you know that, and it's the bio, the biology is overwhelmingly consistent with this. Once you know this, then you know how to target and manage the disease. So, what are some of the uh, trade offs of oxphos versus fermentation? Is it less efficient? Uh, what good and what's bad about it? This pathway? Well, fermentation can keep cells alive for a short period of time. If you hold your breath long enough, I mean, your face will start turning blue. You know, uh, the idea here is that, but you're not going to drop dead instantly because we, our cells are going to be upregulating massive amounts of glucose into the cells for, for glycolytic metabolism to get ATP through, through glycolysis. Um, but that can only last for a short period of time. It can't sustain you. I mean, the best evidence is you have a heart attack. You don't let, you don't live long. The neurons in our brain are very, very uh, sensitive to uh, deprivation of oxygen. So we essentially die from brain damage from heart attacks. But we we don't die instantly. I mean, we have some. That's why you you know you you can rescue people. But you know, it's a very inefficient process because you get the blood fills up with lactic acid very quickly. That's why you're turning purple. You can't get the energy. You can't do this. 
but it can't sustain uh, the high energy demand of the cells of our body. The fermentation can only help us for a short period of time. Um, then we, ha- if we don't get oxygen, we're going to be dead. So, and they, well, you want to kill people fast, you drink the uh, cyanide, right? The, the, they call it taking the Kool-Aid, but it was filled with cyanide. Cyanide shuts down oxidative phosphorylation almost instantly, right? People die from cyanide very quickly. Cancer cells live in cyanide. So clearly they're not using oxygen. So uh, yeah, tumor cells live in, th- in cyanide. They can grow fine in cyanide. That tells us that they're fermenting. All right, they're, f- they're using fermentation. They're using glucose and glutamine to stay alive in the presence of a complete shutdown of oxidative phosphorylation. So all you have to do is target the glucose and glutamine and you'll kill these guys. Not, it's not that complicated. Well, I mean, from what I understand, it is possible to have a diet that's incredibly low in glucose, but glutamine, I believe, is used in many cellular processes. How can you create an environment of low glutamine for a period of time? Well, you have to use drugs and you uh, pulse them. You don't uh, target glutamine. You're absolutely right. Glutamine is essential for the urea cycle, essential for our immune system, essential for our gut health. Glutamine is an extremely valuable amino acid. So if you're going to target uh, glutamine, you have to be very strategic in doing it because if you do it too aggressively and you don't understand the biology of the problem, you can do significant harm to the gut, to the immune system. So another thing, if we kill cancer cells in large numbers, it's the immune system that comes in and cleans up the the, the dead cells in the microenvironment. If you use glutamine the wrong way, those dead cells persist in the microenvironment, leading to all kinds of uh, adverse uh, consequences. And, and so you have to be very strategic about it. You got to know what you're doing. It's not that it's so complicated. It's just that you have to be knowledgeable and educated to understand how to do this. And this is what we're doing. And once we're successful in doing this, most people will say, wow, I can't believe it could be that simple. So uh, the problem is most people, what I just told you, uh, is not known to the majority of people. So from your studies, how do you believe cancer first starts? What will happen in cells first and then the next and next and next? Well, as as Otto Warburg clearly said, um, it's a chronic interruption of oxidative phosphorylation uh, over time. So, I mean, you don't are not a perfectly healthy person one day and wake up with a massive tumor uh, on you the next day. Um, You know, these things happen gradually. So we know uh, what causes cancer. It's damage to the oxidative phosphorylation system with a compensatory uh, transition to fermentation. It's that transition to fermentation and the uh, disruption of oxidative phosphorylation that leads to the uh, genomic instability and somatic mutations that you see in the nucleus. So the mutations and and genetic damage is all downstream epiphenomena. So we know what causes cancer. You you know that, uh, carcinogen. Why they call a compound a carcinogen? I don't don't know. I'm I'm not assuming that I know because I've heard that some viruses can cause certain yes. cancers, and yes. the other theory seems to be just random mutation, which I don't agree with. Yeah, but where does the random mutation come from? Well, from what from what you're saying, if there's a stress, uh, maybe there's active remodeling of the genes that causes what we perceive as a mutation, but maybe it's a stress response, and that's yeah, one well, of the, the facets yeah. of it. So, so what it is is reactive oxygen species, and we know those are a, a lot of cancer cells, almost all of them are throwing out reactive oxygen species. ROS are a carcinogenic and mutagenic. So we can cause nuclear gene mutations through unregulated reactive oxygen. Reactive oxygen species are essential for cell signaling cascades, but when they get out of control, they can lead to a genomic destabilization and point with somatic mutations. There was a couple of beautiful papers showing that P53 uh, defects lead to tremendous ROS uh, causing more somatic mutations. So the somatic mutations are really a downstream epiphenomenon. Before we continue, I've been personally funding the Finding Genius podcast for four and a half years now, which has led to 2,700 plus interviews of clinicians, researchers, scientists, CEOs, and other amazing people who are working to advance science and improve our lives and our world. Even though this podcast gets 100,000 plus downloads a month, we need your help to reach hundreds of thousands more worldwide. Please visit FindingGeniusPodcast.com and click on Support Us. We have three levels of membership from 10 to $49 a month including perks such as the ability to see ahead in our interview calendar and ask questions of upcoming guests, transcripts of podcasts you're interested in, the ability to request specific topics or guests, and more. Visit FindingGeniusPodcast.com and click support us today. Now back to the show. Do, do you think then that 
So Oxfast goes wrong. And do you yes. think there's an abundance of oxygen then in the local cell microenvironment? And some of that through, you know, improper Oxfast gets turned into radical oxygen species, which then mutate the genes? Yeah, I think that's uh, pretty accurate. You know, this is the a cascade of events. And like you said, the viruses, we looked into this, all of the on- oncogenic viruses like papillomavirus and hepatitis C and some of these other viruses, they enter, can- they enter normal cells and either the viruses themselves or the product of the viral genome goes into the mitochondria, destabilizing oxidative phosphorylation. And, and this can happen, you know, over time in a p- particular population of cells in the target organ. Uh, leading to uh, uh, unbridled proliferation in those cells. And when you look at the cells of those viral-induced tumors, they're all fermenting like crazy. But the mechanism is like, how did that virus in the first place lead to the formation of a bunch of cells that are dividing uncontrollably? And when you look back, the virus has targeted the uh, oxidative phosphorylation system, leading to compensatory fermentation. So you can look at uh, x-rays will cause cancer, and we know that x-rays damage oxfos. Intermittent Inflammation, like you, you have uh, intermittent hypoxia and inflammation. I mean, you in a milk duct of a, of a breast or in a, or, or in a prostate or some other uh, organ, if you get intermittent uh, hypoxia or inflammation, you block and damage the respiration of those cells that are suffering, thereby leading to the initiation of a tumor. Age, uh, of course. And then, of course, people always say, well, you know, it's got to be genetic because you have BRCA, BRCA1 and P53, Lee from many and these things. The interesting thing is that those mutations will only cause cancer if they damage mitochondria. And we know there are are about 50%, maybe 40% of women that have the BRCA1 mutation never develop breast cancer because for whatever reason, which we don't know, the mutation of those individuals never damage their mitochondrial respiration. So those are what we call risk factors. They're risk factors. They're not the cause, but they will increase your risk for cancer. We can go down the list and look at every one of the provocative agents that can cause cancer. And it was referred to by the Nobel laureate, Albert St. Gergi, that uh, as the oncogenic paradox, he said, well, geez, you can get cancer from almost everything. And we don't understand how we can get dysregulated cell growth from almost all these provocative agents. And all the provocative agents in one way or another damage respiration, leading to compensatory fermentation and the path to uh, unbridled proliferation. Once you know so, how to connect the dots, it does not become that complicated. So what do you think the first thing that happens to a cell is that its mitochondrial function is impaired. Like what's, what's happening in the mitochondria you think that starts off this whole cascade? Well, I mean, if we're exposed to a chemical carcinogen, you know, the carcinogen enters into a particular cell. Now, of course, if the acute, if the damage to the respiration is acute, in other words, it happens really quick, that cell will die. Just like if it were uh, consuming cyanide, it dies and you can never get a cancer from a dead cell. Uh, This was clear. It's the chronic interruption of respiratory function. And this could happen over decades, uh, or or let's put it this way, years. There are some cancers that can happen, interestingly enough, like within months uh, of the insult, but they're they're not generally the common ones. Uh, The common ones like breast cancer, colon cancer, lung cancer, you know, uh, prostate cancer, uh, these all arise as a protracted interruption of oxidative phosphorylation in a particular cell or population of cells in the tissue, which then leads them to uh, throw out lactic acid, destabilizing the microenvironment, leading to further damage to cells in the surrounding neighborhood. And you get, all of a sudden, you have a, a neoplasia. Uh, the interesting thing, though, is that our immune system recognizes this. And we have cells in our body that recognize these localized disturbances. Problem is many of these cells are macrophages and they come in to try to restabilize or uh, put out the fire and they throw out growth factors and cytokines. It's like putting gasoline on the fire. It's an inappropriate response to a particular situation. And that situation gets worse. And what happens is these macrophages then fuse with some of these localized destabilized cells. And eventually, their mitochondria become corrupted through a dilution process in the cytoplasm. And now these cells are the the origin of the metastatic cell. And metastasis is ultimately the process of cancer that kills most people. And you understand what metastasis is. You understand what the cell is involved that is involved with that process. And you understand that that cell needs massive amounts of glutamine and glucose to do its job. And now you know how to control metastasis. 
If you like this podcast, please click the link in the description to subscribe and review us on iTunes. All right, so question here. So when a cell becomes cancerous, you said it'll tend to release more lactic acid from its, its altered fermentation and respiration? Yes, lactic acid and succinic acid. And there's a destabilization of the microenvironment that also contributes to a facilitatory action to further destabilize oxidative phosphorylation. So it's kind of like a vicious circle. Eventually, you get a cell that now is destabilized. Well, I've seen that many cell types and tissues in our body have their own microbiomes, you know, skin microbiome, vaginal, gut, eye. Perhaps the entire body has, you know, localized microbiome adjacent to any cell. So when the cell gives off more lactic and succinic acid, do you think that a disruption of the local microbiome for that cell is a, is a huge factor in terms of, uh, I don't know, facilitating metastasis? Or what do you think it does? Well, I, I don't call it the microbiome. I call it the microenvironment. It's the tumor cell microenvironment. But, but, but some of the players in the microenvironment of tumor cells, like for instance, I, I interviewed uh, Florencia McAllister, and she said that they were studying pancreatic tumors, uh-huh. and they noticed that the tumors themselves had different localized microbes that hung yes. out with them than yes. the rest of the pancreas. So yes. that's what I mean, like part of the microenvironment, would you say one of their critical players is the local microbes, bacteria, yes. protists, et cetera, that are there? Yes. yes. How That's are they affected then? We have evidence now that um, mycoplasma and uh, certain other uh, papillomaviruses and these other microbes are facilitators of fermentation metabolism. Can you believe this? So uh, we, we know this. There's pa- pa- several papers published uh, on this very process. In other words, the cancer cell will ferment as a result of, of its uh, oxidative phosphorylation defect. But as you just mentioned, these microbes that are infecting the cells, they're inside the cells themselves, are facilitators of uh, enhanced uh, fermentation. And, you know, we study many people in the research industry in cancer uh, study all these highly purified cells and tissues and these germ-free mice. And when you take tumors out of people and you look at, the, the, at what's going on, you see all the, you're exactly right, you see all these microbes. My internal microbes and all this kind of stuff. And, and they are facilitators of the fermentation. So they are pushing this cell further into destabilized energy metabolism. Wait, so a damaged cell. Wow. So there's microbes adjacent and outside the cell membrane, but you said there's also microbes literally in the cytoplasm. Of yeah, the cell. Mycoplas- yeah. Mycoplasma. Yeah. Wow. Mycoplasma. Cytomegalovirus. They're inside, they're inside the cells. So that would mean that there's going to be a turnover. It's like, like a new administration will come in once the cell abandons oxfos and goes more to fermentation. Like, I guess you'd expect all the interior and exterior localized microbes to change over and to be, facilitate this new form of respiration. Yeah, I think they're contributors. I, you know, the bottom line is that it all comes back to, uh, okay, they're facilitating, but they're not, if you can get rid of it, they're still going to be driving the fermentation metabolism which is ultimately what you're trying to target. Well, if they're driving it, what about well, a I wouldn't targeted... say that. I mean, they're facilitating. They're, they're contributors of this. Contributors. What, has it been identified which particular mycoplasma or bacteria or whatever it may be are the strongest facilitators of fermentation? No, but there, there was a, a nice paper by Dr. Yu who uh, evaluated these things quite thoroughly. And um, he, he was the one who, and others have shown, that human cytomegalovirus, which is an infection of, of a number of cells, you know, they, uh, they can contribute to this. If science could figure out which particular organisms were the most, you know, that show up and are the most uh, facilitating of this fermentation, and if you were able to dampen them, that might also be a good adjunct in the therapy, not just glucose and glutamine restriction, but this may be yet another way to, you know, to help, help slow it down yeah. or stop it. Yeah, well, they, you know, they have some drugs, uh, valve cyclovir. It's a drug that targets some of these microbes to try to, uh, they did this for glioblastoma out of Sweden, I believe, uh, or Norway, in one of the Scandinavian countries. Uh, valve cyclovir, it's one of these antiviral medications. And they were able to slow down GBM a little bit. But, you know, the bottom line is the cells are still using glucose and glutamine. So regardless, if you kill the cell, by, start, by taking away its fermental fuels, you don't have to worry about the microbes. They're going to die with the cell. So, um, you know, the bottom line is, is that you're, you're, what's the goal of all of this? The goal of all of this is to get rid of the cancer. But, but you're hinting that glutamine restriction, you have to be real careful with it. So maybe 
that would be the reason maybe to incorporate these other methods too, because then it makes the glutamine restriction easier and less prone to, you know, collateral damage. That's why I suggest it. Yeah, well, it might be. Uh, I certainly not going to exclude it. I, I mean, if we if that could be added as as part of the cocktail, certainly. Has, you know, has one, anyone contemplated phage therapy? You know, the microbes that are inside the cells or around the cells that facilitate the fermentation to stop yeah, them. You know, I don't know about that, but you know, it's much easier just to shut down the glucose and the glutamine. I mean, it, you can do a lot of things. You, what you have when you develop a strategy, you, you have to say what is the probability that I'm going to resolve the disease with this therapy. What is the probability that I'm not going to harm any of the functions of the normal cells and what in what they do, and how easy is it to do? So you you put all these things together and you come to the because there's a lot of Rube Goldbergs out there and these are very highly sophisticated pro, uh, procedures to try to stop cancer like CAR T immunotherapy and and some of these PDL one and all this kinds of stuff. I mean these are very complicated sophisticated kinds of things. Uh, that in my mind are largely unnecessary if I can get rid of the tumor in a much easier way without toxicity. So, I mean, yeah, you can use very expensive, very elaborate procedures to try to kill cancer cells, you know, and this is what we're primarily doing in the clinics today. But, you know, there's, I think there's other ways that we can do the same. The, what is the goal here? The goal is, is to kill cancer cells without, without harming the body, right? Oh, that, yeah, that, yeah. That's the ultimate goal. And, and I'm saying we, we have a plan to do that. And it's very clear. And it's based on hard science. I, I agree with you. It sounds great. Um, are you able to get clinical trials going for this? Or at what stage is this, uh, is so, this at for you? So when you say clinical trial, it's a very costly procedure. Clinical I know. The, the reason I say it, though, is that, you know, unfortunately, that seems to be what everyone wants is clinical trials. Sure. So, you know. Well, who doesn't? You know, the idea here of a clinical trial is double-blind crossover, right? Well, if you're using diet, diet and drug combinations and cocktail procedures, this kind of a, of a strategy is not consistent uh, with the double-blind crossover pharmaceutical model, okay? And then when you do a clinical trial, most of the times that this is supported by major pharmacies, and I haven't seen yet a pharmacy company step forward to say, okay, let's try diets with uh, uh, non-patentable drugs. This just is not part uh, of the financial uh, situation right now, right? It makes sense. So, well, for if it's going to include diet and you know drugs, yeah, maybe you have to chip away at it. And first thing you do is do clinical trials with some drugs, yeah. And then maybe you add the diet in on a separate one or both. I don't know. Well, I mean, you know, if you're the one with the brain tumor, uh, you know, you have two choices. You can go or or the or the advanced lung cancer or whatever. You can say, okay, let's just kind of chip away at this and let's see what we can do. But if it's your ass on the line, you'd be surprised how your viewpoint changes. And, uh, you know, the people that want to stay alive and understand the biology of the problem are eager to do this. We're working on a, a case report right now where a young man uh, who chose for glioblastoma chose no radiation chemo, no standard of care, but metabolic therapy alone. Now he's out almost seven years. He had documented glioblastoma. And he's managed it uh, with non-toxic metabolic therapy. And when, I'm, I'm telling you, when this paper is appears in the literature, there's gonna, it's going to make a, a lot of eyes wide open. You know, why, why do you take cancer patients and subject them to these horrifically toxic therapies? You know, and, and you end up with the patient being compromised to metabolically and physiologically everywhere. And oftentimes, these poor folks die. And you, we don't have to have this. This is unnecessary. And the, the, these, what I'm, what I'm telling you now, is, is not well received, and it's mostly ignored uh, for obvious reasons. I am. I'm sure it is. Yeah. Well, what, so what, what do you, do you work with a clinic that is able to recommend some of these strategies? How do you get, I mean, how do you get this, this hypothesis tested? How do you do it? Yeah, well, what we do is we take individual patients, and we put them on these therapies, and then we publish it, Okay. And they, it goes out into the scientific literature. Then the, the field can decide what they would like to do with this information. Do they want to? How, how do you get individuals to do that? Is it if it's just one person and they choose to do it? Is that how it gets around? It's like considered yeah. self experimentation, or like what? Yeah, well, what, you know, what are the not, rules? Yeah, it's not easy because you know you're you're driven by a medical establishment to say do this, and when you go to the top medical schools, they will tell you, oh, we need standard of care. Uh, which is radiation and chemo and whatever else that might be added to this. 
Then if that doesn't work, well, then maybe we'll consider a metabolic approach. Well, the bottom, we've published a major paper with major physicians and people in the field um, showing how the standard of care actually contributes to the rapid tumor recurrence and death. So you, you're actually stacking the deck against survival by the very treatments that the establishment would like you to use. And, you know, the death rate of cancer is still very, very high. And I'm not saying some of the newer therapies haven't worked. Of course, they, there are people that work that survive these with the newer therapies, but many people have died quickly, very rapidly from some of these new therapies, which, should, which is a tragedy in itself. But the bottom line is, yeah, so we're, there are running big clinical trials right now at Cedar sinai on ketogenic diet metabolic therapy for brain cancer only after standard of care. So my argument is, is that if you did metabolic therapy without standard of care, what would the outcome be? And nobody wants to touch that with a 10-foot pole. Yeah, I'm sure they'll cry that it's unethical, even though it, it... You're talking about ethics? You know, are you're a young, healthy guy, right? You don't have any... Do you have any health issues right now? Well, I've, I've had thyroid cancer. Oh, I thought, but, but right now you're feeling pretty good, right? I feel good, but you never yeah, know, okay. yeah. So if we took you down to Dana-Farber, MD Anderson, and give you the... A, a, a treatment that they would give to advanced pancreatic cancer or brain cancer, I can ta- guarantee you right now, you would be one sick and sick buckaroo. Oh, I believe you. I believe you a hundred percent. Okay. So, I mean, well, is there, is there any chance that you could do it without standard of care? Yeah. The guy we're working on right now took no standard of care. He's doing fine. So how, how does that work? I would think like, do people come to you before they go to the doctor or if they're seeing a doctor, yeah. How do they work with you and then tell the doctor what's okay. going on? And the doctor will be like, no, 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 don't, don't do that. No, no, I never, I never tell anybody anything like that. So if they come to me before, when they first diagnosed, I give them information, published articles in the scientific literature to educate them. Then they would go and talk to their oncologists or whatever, and then they would come to a, a group decision. So if the patient knows that if I go the, the course of standard of care, especially for glioblastoma, you know, I have a 98% chance of not surviving for three years. All right. But if I do metabolic therapy, it's unknown what the outcome will be, but I could live as long or longer. And certainly my quality of life would be a hell of a lot better. Um, so you, the patient and the family have to come to that decision. They, you know, I, I can't, I don't tell them what to do or what not to do. I simply show them the liter- the scientific papers from the literature and here's the outcome. And a lot of these pe- poor people have never seen survival statistics from the very treatments they are given. The doctor doesn't come in and say, look, let me show you where you're going to fall on this survival chart. They don't know that. And many of these poor people think that the treatments they're getting are going to be curative, not palliative. Palliative is only to right. keep you alive a little bit longer. It's not to cure you. And, but yet they view the, the treatment that they're getting from these top oncology centers as potentially curable. And that's misinformation. You know, you got to look at, you know, show the survival curve at your age, at your situation, where you think you're going to fall on your survival curve. And that boy, that opens your eyes real fast. Uh, well, sure, what else yeah. is there? Uh, Doc, what else is there? And the answer is, no, this is the only, this is the only path you have. And that's misinformation. These guys don't know the stuff that I just told you. They need to read the scientific literature and look. Well, there's no evidence to support that. That might be true, but there's plenty so, of evidence. So yeah, so the people that you're working with, is it called anecdotal or what would you call it? What, what, you know, how many people have you worked with and helped and well, what do you, you call know, that bulk of information? Like, what do you well, do we, with it? No, no, we published several papers. And, you know, the guy we had from Egypt who, who was really doing very well, a young man who had glioblastoma, his whole left side was paralyzed and is a corn farmer. And, uh, you know, they, they came to me, the, the oncology group asked if metabolic therapy would help this guy. So we actually put him on metabolic therapy for three weeks before we did the debulking surgery on this individual. He was doing great. It really, really came well. And then we postponed radiation therapy for three months, which is unheard of in the oncology field. But they pressured, pressured, pressured uh, to give this poor guy massive doses of radiation. And, and I told the oncologist, I said, why are you doing this? The, guy's, the guy is really doing well. He's very healthy. Oh, no, no. We have to do this. Everybody in the world does this, which is true. So they irradiated this guy. And he did pretty good. He was doing very well. He, he survived the, the radiation treatment and the temozolomide and all this so-called standard of care. But then, at, uh, and we published the paper at 24 months. So he, he was surviving for 24 months with pretty good health. But then at 30 months of age, he started developing headaches. And he died very quickly. Autopsy uh, of the 
showed uh, massive radiation necrosis damages his brain. His brain was liquefied from the damn radiation. Jesus. So what the hell are you talking about? What'd you call it earlier? Is it ethical? You, you even say, is it ethical to go and do metabolic therapy over standard of care? I'm saying, is it ethical to irradiate somebody's brain until it liquefies? You know, well, no, uh, I, I agree with you. I just, I brought it up because I'm sure that's what a lot of medical uh, people would say. It's unethical to do that. Yeah, well, it's unethical to irradiate somebody also. Uh, I agree. I agree right. with you. I, <laughs> Let me clarify the situation. I'm not opposed to radiation therapy for every kind of a cancer. In fact, if you have evidence that radiation therapy can provide a 90% or better uh, recovery rate and management of the disease, then go for it, okay? But when you take someone with a glioblastoma or some of these other major advanced cancers and you start nuking them, I said that is fundamentally unethical. Yeah, I gotcha. You talked about the standard of care. You know, I guess well, it wouldn't be the surgery, but it'd be the chemo and the radiation um, accelerating, I believe, metastases or just you know the cancer itself in general. What you know under under the model that you understand, what's happening with the standard of care to drive cancer's progression? Yeah, that's a great point. Yeah, what happens is when you create the, the radiation creates an incredibly uh, diverse microenvironment, rich in glucose and glutamine. We published a, a major paper in, in Lancet Oncology, one of the top cancer journals in the world, clearly outlining, outlining how radiation contributes to the rapid recurrence and death of the patients. So you surgically debulk the tumor. You create a, a, a wonderful wound in the brain, and, and the wound frees up large amounts of, of glutamine in, in that microenvironment. And then oftentimes you give high dose steroids to reduce the inflammation, both from the surgery and the radiation. Because when you're, when you're irradiated, your tissues and brain swell. Uh, so you give high dose steroids, which elevate blood sugar levels. Can you believe this? So the very fuels you're trying to cut off to the surviving tumor cells are elevated by, by the standard of care. And then they wonder, oh, the tumor recurred and you died. Well, well I mean, you, you did the very things you were not supposed to do when you understand the biology of, of the problem. So, so you don't want to do that. And, and, and furthermore, what is known is that when you irradiate tissues, you, you facilitate fusion hybridization between the cells. So the macrophages that are coming in to try to correct the damage in the micro environment fuse with the remaining, some of the remaining tumor cells, and they become the most highly invasive cells that you can possibly deal with. And they'll spread outside of that location, spread through the brain, or even or even if they're a pancreas, they'll spread through your body or lung, they'll spread through your body. And it becomes a, a, a brush fire you can't put out any longer. So the very what do, therapy, they, what, do you, what do you mean they fuse? Like what, what happens with the macrophage? They, they, they fuse. fuse actually with cells? Really? Yes. What's, that, very what's that called? A, a fusogenic processes, a membrane fusogenesis. Macrophages are highly fusogenic cells, and that they evolve to do that to facilitate wound healing. So you get these multinucleated giant cells. You get all these fused hybrids. Macrophages do that to uh, enhance their capabilities of re repairing wounds. This is a well-known biological phenomenon. But when you have cancer, oh, wow. that's the last thing you want to do is create a microenvironment that leads to fusogenicity, especially between macrophages and neoplastic tumor cells. And therefore, the cytoplasm of the macrophage gets diluted with the cytoplasm of the neoplastic cell, and they become rogue macrophages, respecting no uh, longer biological order. And they spread through your body, leading to, and they survive in the, in the circulation because they are part of the immune system, and they're, and they're highly immunosuppressive. So all this crap that you're throwing at them from immunotherapies, that doesn't, they're not going to stop these guys for the most part, and the patients are going to die. So uh, you got to know the biology of the of the problem you're dealing. With. If you don't know the biology of the problem, man, you're going to be just you know doing all kinds of crazy stuff that's going to be harmful to the patient. Yeah, I've heard that tumors are very heterogeneous, and then you know once you hit them with chemo and radiation, they become even more heterogeneous. But yeah, yeah, again, uh, again, under your model, um, yeah, under, is there okay. heterogeneity in yeah, yeah. their use of oxfos, their fermentation ability, their fermentation pathways, or is it they're all the same yeah. within a given tumor? Yeah, well, they're all the same. Every tumor is fermenting in that in that population, whether it's a mesenchymal part of the tumor, whether it's a, a stem cell part of the tumor, whether it, a stem cells can't metastasize, um, but they grow like crazy. Whereas the mesenchymal kinds of cells, oh, those are the dangerous ones. Those are the ones that will spread through the tissue and potentially leave and enter the circulation, intravisation, extravisation, all these terms that uh, are underlying the metastatic cascade. So so uh, the bottom line is that is, is you want to try to... Uh, 
prevent all that. And here, here's the situation. So they say, well, it's th- these tumor cells are so resistant to chemo. Oh, are they? Yeah. Well, why do you think they're resistant to chemo? Because they're from the, the very P glycoprotein. It's the name of a protein on the surface of cells that's designed to pump drugs and harmful products outside of the cells. And the energy to run that pump, that P glycoprotein pump, is driven by fermentation, like <laughs> energy through fermentation. Can you believe this? So, so the, the very chemical you're trying to do to kill the tumor cell is being pumped out because the cells are fermenting. So how do you kill tumor cells? You stop their fermentation. It's not that, I tell you, it's actually, I feel embarrassed to say how non-complicated this whole situation is. So uh, when you see all these people dying from all this stuff, it's because of the absurdity of what they're treating these poor folks with. I mean, once you understand the biology, what I'm telling you not only makes sense, it's shocking that anyone would ever try that in the first place. Are you able to observe someone's tumor uh, longitudinally, for instance, as they're going through your protocol? What, yeah. you know, if, 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 what happens? Does the tumor shrink in a different way? What happens to the heterogeneity? Like what, what parts are affected first and next and next? And what, what clues does that give you to, you know, the efficacy of the method? Yeah. So we had the, the paper we're working on right now actually addresses that because the guy had a, was diagnosed with glioblastoma. And he chose not any, no radiation, no chemo, no, no surgery either. So just metabolic therapy, which was lowering his blood sugar and elevating his blood ketone levels. And the tumor grew very, very slowly. Uh, it was diagnosed as a GBM from biopsy at the original thing. It grew very, very slowly. Three, three years later, three years down the road, the tumor is now becoming slowly larger. It was originally diagnosed as non-operable because of its tentacular behavior uh, appearance from the cells, from the biopsy material and from the uh, MRI. So they called it a non-operable glial. Yeah, we can get some, but we can't get it all. You know, the same story you hear over and over again. But after three years, uh, they looked at the tumor and said, you know, this might not, this might be operable now. Uh, so he made a decision to go in and decided to get the tumor debulked. So he debulked the tumor, chose no radiation, no chemo and went back on metabolic therapy. And that was four years ago. And MRI's analysis are showing residual evidence of something, but it has no malignant transformation and no, no continual growth. And, and the guy's out almost six and a half years uh, with something that would have killed him in, in, in like 20 months. You know, so what you're, the answer to your question is yes, we can see this. And, and, we, and we've seen it ourselves. And we published a very a paper in, in a journal showing how the, the behavior of the tumor cells dramatically changes under, under a, a microscopic examination. They don't invade anymore. They start dying and they stop invading, right? And, they, and you don't disturb the microenvironment. What more? I mean, this is like, okay, what more do you want? Well, what happens if uh, there are existing metastases and someone goes on your protocol? Like what's observed with the primary versus the metastases? Does one go first? Does communication between them seem to stop? Like what, what's observed? Uh, what's observed is that they go away. The spots, the, the images on PET scan or MRI, uh, and, and the physicians are often miffed. Wow, what happened? What did you do? Uh, wh- whatever you're doing, keep doing it. it. It's not like, you know, what the hell's going on here? You know, when you start targeting glucose and glutamine, the damn cells can't live. They're going to go away. They're going to die. So uh, that's what happens. The, the spots that you had indicative of metastatic lesions go away. All right. And the, well, how do you feel? I feel good. The person says, I feel no, good. I, I, I totally understand that the end goal obviously is living and health and all that. It's just, you know, in science, I'm curious and I'm sure a lot of science, scientists are curious about mechanism and what's yeah. observed and all that. That's why I'm asking you these nuances. So the, so the, yeah, I don't plan. So the mechanism is very simple. The tumor cell cannot grow without availability of glucose and glutamine. So any, any therapy that would disrupt the availability of glucose and glutamine to those cells will kill them. They die. Yeah, I just, I, again, I just wonder if there's a preferential killing of, you know, uh, I don't know, maybe the shape of the tumor changes in such a way that gives you a clue, you know, the, yeah, well, we've, I don't know. We've looked, at, uh, we've looked at this, and it is kind of uh, striking. You know, there's a whole field of, of cell death in the, in the field of biology. Cells die from many different mechanisms. There's, there's apoptosis, there's necrosis death, and then there's whole levels of different kinds of names that they give for these different forms of death. And when we looked at the effect of these metabolic therapies on different kinds of tumors, it seemed like the, the appearance of the cell as it was dying di- differed from one kind of a tumor to the other. So I think it has to do with the biology of the cell. And I think that's my best 
My, my, it looks like mitotic, there's another one called mitotic catastrophe. You know, when we killed the metastatic cells, they died by necrotic death. But when we killed the, the proliferating stem cells, they seem to die by mitotic catastrophe. You know, I, I know I have a lot of co- colleagues in the field that are loving different mechanisms of cell death. Personally, between you and me, I don't give a rat's ass how the cells are dying, <laughs> as long as they're dying. What, what is mitotic catastrophe, by the way? That's a term used when the cells can can, can no longer f- form mitoses, which is the lining up of the chromosomes on the metastatic, uh, on the uh, uh, metaphase plate, you know, the, the separation mm. of the chromosomes. They just seem to croak, but they, but they look differently under the microscope. So it's really kind of interesting. They look like fried eggs. I, you know, I mean, my friends get like, oh, wow, they get all excited about this. You know, I just move on. I'm moving on to kill them all. I don't really care how they're dying. I think once we get rid of the, the tumors, ah, we got nothing else to do. Let's go back and figure out how we kill these guys. Yeah, no, I understand right? what you mean. I understand. So how many different people have gone through the, the protocol that, uh, that you've come up with? Well, we're, we're building the protocols all the time. We have uh, clinics all over the, the world uh, that are very excited about this. And, you know, the bottom line is that they're all groping, say, what do we do? You know, I, I wrote this big paper with my colleagues, the Press Pulse uh, Strategy for Managing Cancer. And, you know, you bring the body into a new metabolic state first. And then, uh, you know, in other words, you bring yourself into a healthy state. You can't believe how many cancer patients are screwed up so many ways in, in being unhealthy. You know, they, some of them have type 2 diabetes, uh, uh, high blood pressure, this, that, all these other kinds of things. And, uh, you know, you got to bring the body back into a state of metabolic homeostasis. And then once you get into a, a situation where your glucose is down, your ketones are up, what we call therapeutic ketosis, then we use pulsing, like you said, at the very beginning, went very accurately. How do you take away glutamine, which is such an important amino acid? Well, we pulse. We hit them strategically just for a short period of time. Um, we don't just keep the glutamine uh, hammer on them all the time because the normal cells are going to get hammered as well. So you got to know. And also what we've published, a beautiful paper showing that once the patient is in, once the individual is in therapeutic ketosis, the glutamine drugs can be reduced by half and they penetrate into the tumor through blood brain barriers uh, three times faster than if you didn't do that. So the whole, oh, wow. it's a, it's a, yeah, I'm telling you, it's unbelievable. So, um, so you got to know what to do. And this is the cutting edge of what we are, where we are right now. If people want to say, well, how come you're not doing this in all these clinics and everything else? Well, we're starting to do it. People are responding really well, but we have not yet, uh, with the exception of a few people. And I don't want to say we haven't because there's a lot of people with uh, triple negative breast cancer. They should have been dead that are out years later and they're doing very well. It's just that I, Listen, I, I got to write these papers up. You think it's easy writing up case reports? You know, it's, it's not easy. So, but I write them up. And once we get enough of them, you know, you're going to have a tipping point because people basically want to live. I mean, you're diagnosed with a glioblastoma, man. You, you're, you're finished. You know, you're diagnosed with, with uh, triple negative breast cancer, metastasis to lung and brain. I mean, this yeah. is not good. Uh, and I'm saying we can save these people. We, we, we can actually save these people uh, from rapid death. I'm not saying we can yeah. cure them. But I can certainly say we can give them a lot longer quality of life. And maybe, maybe in the future, we can resolve this completely. Do you have doctors on staff or do you, well, listen, does a person a, have their own doctor and they choose, they work, you work with the doctor? I work with doc. I work with physicians. Yes. Okay. I, I, in all different countries, all over the world. And uh, we were starting a, a global society for metabolic. They believe, you believe me, there's a tremendous interest on the part of physicians all over the world. I mean, they're in the front lines treating these folks and they want to see patients get healthy. That's their job. That's why they took on this profession. And when they see the potential of what I'm talking about, and they've actually recognized this in a couple of their uh, patients, they want to know more. And, and the problem we have is that a lot of the physicians that would like to do this are not trained to understand what's going on yet. They can be quick learners, of course, and they need to be able to do it. And right now, the system, uh, the way it's set up, does not allow them to do that. They'll lose their license to practice medicine if they implement therapies that is not sanctioned by the American Medical Association. So they want to do it, but they're inhibited from doing it. And then there's another whole group of physicians that would never want to do it because it might interfere their their salary. So you you got to look at all, and the hospitals are in the business of generating revenue. And you're going to bring on a therapy that may not generate the same level of revenue, but that can be addressed. I I think these things are secondary. I, I think the bottom line is, can you keep terminal cancer patients alive two, three, four times longer than they were predicted to survive. And that's the goal. So how do people that, that speak to you, how did they get in? I mean, I can see the dietary stuff's under their control, but 
how do they get these uh, these glutamine inhibiting drugs? Where do they get them from? Yeah, well, that's that's an issue. Uh, and not only glutamine inhibiting drugs, and this is another thing. Sometimes the the industry, the pharmaceutical industry or whatever industry will scarelli these. You know what that means? Yeah, You know what that term means? What, what is the term again? Scarelli. They scarelli the drugs. Scarelli. Oh, it sounds like someone's last name that they did it two years ago. Yeah, you know, remember Martin Scarelli, the guy who jacked up the price of the EpiPens? Oh, okay. Yeah. All remember right. that guy, Martin Scarelli, that, that, yeah, that yeah. low life? All right. So he, uh, these people needed for, uh, you know, uh, anaphylaxis and things like this. The pill depends with three or $4 a piece. He jacked them up to $800 and he did it because he could, he wanted to make a lot of money on it. So you have, you have various drugs that are sitting around, not thought to be very, very valuable. All of a sudden you put that in the right context and you see, whoa, this drug is really powerful. So what, instead of like embendazole, right? Right. I, we can go, we can, Canada is 89 cents a tablet in, in Turkey. It's like a dollar a tablet. In the United States, it's $385 a tablet. Whoa. So, I mean, this is the, the unethical, uh, actually immoral behavior. So, I mean, if you want to you manage cancer, you can do it uh, without all the interference from, from individuals that are, uh, that are driven by greed. So, uh, um, uh, you know, our, our job is to manage the disease uh, non-toxically, cost-effectively. Uh, and we can do that. Uh, it can be uh, done. Yeah, what, what kind of uh, cancers have you worked with people on? And what, you know, have you noticed any differences in survival or progression, uh, we, et cetera? Yeah, yeah we've, we've done every kind of a cancer, uh, blood cancers we've done with people. Now, I don't publish this. You say, I, I got to, well, I can't believe it unless it's published. Well, of course, but the ones we are, we're tackling glioblastoma. I mean, if we can manage that, you can manage almost anything because they're all the same. I look at the metabolism of glioblastoma, it's the same a bladder cancer, uh, non small lung cancer triple negative breast cancer, all the cancers the same. Well, what if they're all the same, what makes some cancers, I mean, why would cancer spread preferen- preferentially to secondary sites and not other sites? And why are some aggressive and not aggressive? Like under well, the models you understand, what, what drives that? Yeah, well, that's the macrophage. The, the macrophage homes to the, t- the, or, or the tissues that it, that it does biologically. And, we, and it's a non-random. In fact, it was called seed soil by, by Paget back in the 1800s with breast cancer. Breast goes to lung and, and uh, liver. A lot, of, a lot of tumors go to liver. And eventually, they, they go to brain. And you say, well, what, what could explain that? It was called the seed soil. Well, we defined what the, the nature of the seed soil is. So uh, there was some experiments in mice where they took macrophages out of mice and labeled them and then uh, injected them back into other mice just to see where they would go. And they preferably went to lung and liver, the same, the same places. You, you look at the tissues um, that have a lot of turnover, like lung, can, l- lung tissue, for example, is constantly confronted by, by potential pathogens from the air that we breathe. So lung has a very high turnover of macrophages. The liver is another organ that's detoxifying stuff in our bloodstreams. So they have a very uh, heavy need for the availability of local macrophages. So when you get lung cancer or, or uh, lung cancer or these other cancers, they spread to these very organs that oftentimes have, uh, have a need for, for macrophage function. So we've looked into all of these kinds of things and uh, we can come back and parse out you know, wh- what's going on. And we know once you understand what they need to survive, which is glucose and glutamine, and then you have to say to yourself, well, geez, if that's so clear, how come nobody's doing that? And they're, uh-huh. Why nobody's doing that? Why nobody in a clinical trial anywhere on the planet is simultaneously targeting glucose and glutamine like we just published in our major eye science paper? Why is that? If I just told you the key to understanding how to manage cancer, why in the hell is nobody doing that? That's your, you should ask people about that. What would it take for you to be able to do a clinical trial? Is it just money well, or are there other showstoppers? Well, first of all, I'm, I'm in a biology department at Boston. We don't even have a medical school, right? So we don't right. do any of that. But my colleagues in other countries that are in clin- medical clinics are doing modifications of what I just said. I think we can use some of the chemo drugs. They can be used probably at half or one third the dosages that we're giving to patients. When the patient is in th- therapeutic ketosis, these chemo drugs work a hell of a lot better. You know, Longo's group out there in California has been showing that water-only fasting, you give patients chemo and it, and it works a hell of a lot better and the patients don't get nearly as sick. So, I mean, this is all part and parcel of, of maintaining a healthy microenvironment uh, in the body and making, uh, uh, get, you know, getting more bang for your therapeutic buck. Uh, when you do this, you don't give patients with cancer big chocolate cakes and candy like like so many people do. They they do in the infusion centers. I know 
family member that was in there last year, and that's what they gave her. So, yeah. Oh, well, that's absurd. I know. That's absurd. That's, know. that's, cri- that's almost like uh, criminal uh, medical. It's almost like medical negligence. I know. So this is what I call the lack of knowledge. The lack of knowledge in the oncology field is so profound, which contributes to the tremendous suffering and death that all these poor folks are, are dealing with, uh, primarily from a failure. What I just told you is supported by, by all these scientific publications. It's not like this is, uh, this is what, I mean, you just have to read the literature and understand it and then implement. So what, what help would, you know, if you were able to ask for help right now, what help would you want? Well, we, what we do here at our, at, yeah, we, we, our, our research program at Boston College runs on the good donations of people, right? The good intentions of, of people. You know, I, I give them information. I don't charge anything for the information. Travis Christofferson's Foundation for Metabolic Cancer Therapies supports our research massively. And we get money from private foundations and, pri- and individuals. You know, we've had some success and these individuals are alive because of what we've done. So we survive. So if people want to donate to our research, they, they, they donate to the Travis Christofferson's Foundation. He wrote the book, Tripping Over the Truth. Yeah, I know that book, yeah. Uh, yeah, which is outlining why the metabolic theory of cancer is exploding right now, because it's the right way to go. When you look in the clinics, most of the therapies are based on the somatic mutation theory of cancer, which right. we now undermine. So if your therapies, what all cancer patients should ask their, their physicians, your oncologist, what kind of treatment are you giving me? Is it based on the metabolic theory of cancer or the somatic mutation theory of cancer? And to be, it's embarrassing that some physicians don't even know the difference. Oh, um, so they get it right in the what? Yeah, right. Well, you can't have that. I mean, you're this guy, these guys, their lives are on the, uh, at stake here. Your very yeah. soul to exist on the planet is at stake. And you're asking someone who's clueless about the very nature of the disease that he's treating. There's a problem here. There's a problem here. So if the oncologist can articulate in a very clear way why he thinks the strategy that he's using might, might in fact be better or uh, complementary to metabolic therapy, at least you're talking to somebody that understands the situation rather than saying, oh, there's no evidence for this or no, if, I, if it were important, I would have heard about it. Well, how many scientific yeah, yeah. articles do you read? You know, the, the argument here is a, a lack of knowledge. Now, our research at Boston College is developing the very diet drug combinations that will eventually lead to the resolution of cancer. And I work with clinicians all over the world, and we adapt these therapies that we develop because these physicians, you know, they don't want to treat a patient that could harm that patient. If I've done the troubleshooting and done all the different connections to know that this is not going to kill your patient, and your patient's probably going to survive a lot longer, they're very comforted to know that information. So it gives them a little bit of uh, security and, and understanding that I've tested this and it looks like it works. And the, the, pro, the, the subjects that we're treating are preclinical models that are the best. We've developed clearly the, the models that best represent human cancer, all different forms of human cancer. And I can tell you that these subjects are healthy. Uh, they're responding well and they live far longer. And I think if we tweak the system for the human uh, we can get the similar or even better results. As a matter of fact, humans that we've tested do far better than the mice that we're working with. I'm shocked sometimes. I, I can't believe how long and healthy some of these people, how healthy they are, how long they live. I, I says, I can't get that degree of survival in the in the preclinical system. But at least well, the preclinical got, system tells us where to go. Yeah. If you characterize whether this therapy you're talking about works better early on or later stage or it doesn't matter, what have you observed? Well, we've observed every every scenario like you just mentioned, because some people start early on this and uh, some people, you know, unfortunately, there are people who come to us uh, with stage four. And they failed every every treatment strategy. You know, they're, they're like a walking skeleton. They look like Tammy Baker, you know, Jim and Tammy Baker. Did you ever see her? Yeah, she, she was. It was horrific. Her, her makeup. and yeah, Well, was. it was the, it was what she looked like from traditional cancer therapies. Oh, and, I didn't realize that, that that happened to her. Huh. Oh God, go on the web and look at it. It's, it's horrific. Really? Well, so you you can't take a person in that stage and say, okay, we're going to do it. You know, restrict metabolic therapy on you. They they won't be able to to tolerate that. Yeah. So you you have to take and and many cancer patients are look really healthy, and then they come back from the physician with a long face. Oh, I was just diagnosed with an advanced cancer. Can you believe this? 
And then they start irradiating and poisoning these guys. And the next thing you know, they look horrible and they many of them die. So if you get them off the bed, listen, the guy that we're working with chose not to do any of that. And his quality of life is, is very good. I mean, he never suffered this. And what we see sometimes is the people who go on metabolic therapy, they have a very high quality of life right up until a couple of days before they pass. Mm. And this is very different than standard of care where they're brutalized and poisoned and, and irradiated and treated with all kinds of stuff. And they die a slow, uh, painful, uh, excruciating death and, right. and uh, debilitating. So, you know, we, we fair degree of success, but we, we don't have complete success because sometimes the patients, they come and they're already beaten up so bad by the system and they just can't do metabolic therapy. What about, uh, you know, everyone's uh, attempt for early diagnosis, you know, liquid biopsies, et cetera. What's your yeah, opinions well, I, you know, there? Yeah, well, the biopsy, what we, we, we discourage biopsies, um, mainly because we have so many articles showing how the bi- taking biopsy tissue actually creates an inflammatory microenvironment that could potentially lead to fusion hybridization and spreading the tumor. You yeah, know, like I had with, with thyroid, uh, you know, they, they took this cannula and poked it into my neck to yeah. get into some of the, you know, uh, some of the areas and to determine if it was cancer. So what, what could that have done? Would it have driven cancer cells into like a wound tract and, yes. and gotten them to proliferate? Yes. That's exactly right. And it doesn't really? happen to everybody, but it happens to enough. There's enough people where it happens, where there's several scientific reports for all kinds of cancers, brain cancer, lung cancer, colon cancer, prostate cancer, uh, liver cancer. So uh, biopsies, uh, you run the risk of spreading the cancer with a biopsy. So what do you do then? Well, we have plenty of non-invasive ways to know whether or not you have a tumor. So if you go on metabolic therapy and the tumor shrinks really small, you can debulk it completely. Or if it goes away, you don't need to do anything. So why put the patient at risk by, by doing all these nonsensical things? And then the, the driving, the, one of the drivers to, to valid or to say we need to do this is to look at gene expression profiles in the tissue that you biopsy. Oh, you have this mutation that it's all, it's all irrelevant. The mutations don't mean anything. They're all downstream epiphenomena. If I pull the plug on the glucose and glutamine, the cell dies. So the, the mutations in that cell become entirely irrelevant. So uh, why? So there's, there's big companies that make a billion dollars on doing uh, bio, uh, gene profiles on biopsy material. Uh, they're down here in Cambridge, Massachusetts, and they're all over the place. They do, oh, we got to look at your gene expression profile. No, you don't. Yeah. Why are you doing that? Oh, we have to know because we can treat you. So in other words, oh, I got this mutation. Uh, in my cancer, how am I? Well, we're going to give you radiation and chemo. What the hell? What? what, the, what the, oh no, we have a special immunotherapy that's going to go in there. But if I pull the plug on the glucose and glutamine, I kill the tumor cell. You, know, you don't have to do any of that. So, so it eliminates that whole field of of oncology. You don't need to do any of that stuff. You know. Now, of course, what I'm telling you is like, oh, this is too. You can't believe this guy. He must be nuts. No, I'm not nuts. The people doing it are the nuts. One last question. You said that um, you know people will have a longer quality of life with your protocol. But you also mentioned that some of them will just suddenly die. What, why would that happen? Well, because, because you know, uh, some of them may have taken standard of care. And the other thing, too, is to be honest with you, uh, we, uh, many of these people that I spoke, uh, we, we haven't really targeted their glutamine yet. We're, we're just hammering the glucose right now. But, but once we get on top of the glutamine issue with this cocktail, as I said, it's a diet drug cocktail. Uh, there's no food. People always say, well, I got to restrict glutamine. You can't do that. Glutamine is everywhere. It can be synthesized from other amino acids. So you've got to use a drug, but you've got to know how to wield it properly. I mean, even the guy who does radiation, right? He, he's not sitting there irradiating somebody's head until the smoke comes out of the guy's ears. I mean, he obviously knows what to do, right? So he's not micro- hopefully he's not microwaving their head, essentially, right? Yeah, well, that's what I'm saying. I mean, these guys, they, they go to school to know how, how, not to, how not to treat you so smoke doesn't come out of your ears. But if they want smoke to come out of your ears, you get some numbskull doing it. Smoke will come out of your ears and your nostrils right. and whatever. So, but that, but I'm saying, you know, you got to know how to wield the power uh, of the medication, the medicine that you're using. And you have to know how that medicine works in under, in different environments. Uh, so under therapeutic ketosis, you can reduce significantly the dosage and the timing at which you use these medications, which is really wonderful because you can keep the patient out of the hospital from other collateral damage. You know, so many cancer patients suffer in their lives uh, from secondary effects of the treatments they use to cure them. 
um, you know, digestive issues, hormonal imbalances, neuropsychiatric problems. I mean, to cure a person of cancer today, uh, yeah, the cancer could be cured, but now you've opened up a whole new array, array of medical conditions that that individual never had, but, but the fact he was treated with all these toxic uh, treatments. So, you know, we, we've looked at every nook and cranny of this problem um, and studied it and evaluated it and know how to avoid these things. And I think it's just a matter of time. I don't know how long it's going to take for the field to come to realize that what we're saying. But the bottom line is that the cancer patient wants to live. And there's a lot, there's a lot of motivation in that. Yeah, oh yeah. Well, very good. Tom, what's the best way for people to reach you if, God forbid, they are a family member of someone they know has cancer and they, they're interested in finding out more from you? You know, I have a, an email at Boston College. People email me. I give them a kit of information. I, I notify them about Miriam Kalamian and her book, Keto for Cancer. She's a wonderful person, mm-hmm. uh, walks a lot of the cancer patients through the minefield and how to do all this stuff, you know, and, and other, other resources, scientific publications, to support, you know, at least it's a way of, to give them knowledge so they don't go into these situations uh, blindfolded. And as I said, we get our funding from private foundations and the goodwill of individuals that support us. And, uh, and we're working to develop a standardized drug diet protocol that will eventually replace uh, the majority of uh, procedures that exist currently today. Okay. Well, very good. Well, Tom, thanks for coming on the podcast. I really appreciate it. Okay. Thank you very much for having me.